Well, it's so great to have Dale here and to have this conversation. You know, the the book, of course, you wrote the book before COVID, and then uh, and the title of the book is Stalled, Hope and Help for Pastors Who Thought They'd Be Here By Now. And then all of a sudden, the whole world got stalled, and it was like super stalled to zero for a while. Then we came back from COVID, and then we found that, you know, we didn't come back at the fuller level. We might have come back at a lower level. We feel stalled. So it's kind of interesting how all these things sort of uh, came together, and hopefully uh, lots of people have found help and encouragement in your book. So, But let's kind of start a little bit, because in your book, you describe being so discouraged as the pastor of a small church that you believed your life itself actually was a failure. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that belief and the impact it had on you. Well, Ed, I think the biggest thing that happened to me, I felt like Jesus was disappointed with me because I hadn't built a large mega church. And uh, I had I had the first 10 years, my wife and I, Gina, were married. We traveled on the road with Christian music groups. So we did about 1,100 concerts in churches all over the country. And, and so I worked with lots of churches. I saw a lot of uh, what was happening in churches. Then I was on staff at a church. And so when I came off the road, I thought, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to this next town. I, I started a church that had 30 people in it. And I really thought I had was, go, was called to go there to build a mega church. And dude, I tried to implement all the stuff, you know, the stuff that you, you were teaching, the stuff that Maxwell's teaching, everybody's teaching. And I tried to implement that stuff. And for some reason, it didn't work for me. And so uh, I internalized that, uh, and I began to work harder, and and it didn't it didn't go anywhere. And so uh, the book title actually came from the fact that when I built a house, I, we had borrowed a forklift to, uh, to, it was a log house and I had to get this huge forklift. Well, I love playing on that kind of stuff. And the night before the logs were supposed to come to build the house, uh, I got the forklift so stuck that all four tires were spinning in the mud. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm at a point now where I got to get help. I can't get this thing unstuck. And so um, I was just at a place, dude, where I just thought, man, Jesus, he must be so disappointed that he even created me. Mm, fascinating. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And it might be a small church, might be a large church for that matter. But I, I do think this is a time that is testing people's um, relationship with the Lord, particularly if their relationship with the Lord is tied up to their performance in their local church. Um, now, again, you do you, the 95 Network works a lot with small churches. And our audience is probably, I mean, just because most pastors pastor churches that are small churches mm-hmm. and have lots of small church pastors. Uh, but also a mix, you know, all kinds of people listen to the podcast. So how do the challenges, and let, let's just talk about small church pastors for the next question, and then we'll talk more broadly. How do the challenges of small church pastors face now compared to the ones they dealt with before COVID? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and maybe tell us some about our view of discouragement in ministry. Well, here's the, here's what I was, I was actually talking to Jessica about this just a few minutes ago before we came Jessica's on. Jessica's our producer, for those who don't know. Yeah, and she's awesome. Uh, I was just saying how, you know, before the pandemic, we kind of knew we needed to make some changes, but we didn't do those changes. Uh, and so what we discovered was if your church was at least embracing some technology, already had some things in place, the, the pandemic affected all of us. But But if you were doing some things in the right way beforehand, you were able to get through it okay. But if you were not, it be, you got very exposed. I wrote an article last year called Seven Years in Seven Weeks. And basically, I feel like a lot of churches found out where they were going to be in seven years, but they got there in seven weeks. Uh, and and so pastors were exposed. Well, as you know, as, as well as I do, when you don't know what to do, you tend to go back to your default. And, and, and if your default wasn't working before, then you begin to recognize, I don't know what to do now. Now, I will tell you this, Ed, one of the most encouraging things that I'm seeing now is this is first time in my life where I've seen uh, a large group of pastors reaching out going, I need help. I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I've done everything I was trained to do. I've done what I've done before, what I did before, and it's not working. And see, they have financial pressures. They have the uh, marital pressures. Uh, it's just every, it's like everything in life is kind of caving in on them. And so that discouragement is, has been pushed to the surface, if you will. And um but I will say the encouraging thing is they are uh, we are seeing churches reach out, pastors reach out, ministry leaders reach out to help for help for the first time. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out too, um, you know, if churches by size have been disproportionately impacted. I think some of the data that comes out is showing that small churches did uh, everyone kind of suffered and dropped some. Sometimes some data seems to say small churches were disproportionately impacted. Some say it's not. I think maybe early on smaller churches were. So it's kind of hard to tell. But I'm kind of all of us sort of feel that sense of stall, you know, that mm-hmm. sense of, of, of stuck. And um, I shouldn't say all, I mean, it depends about where you are, what your situation is as well. 
But the one of the things in the book, and again, the title the title of the book sort of gets at that. It says um, it's called "Stalled: Hope and Help for Pastors Who Thought They'd Be There by Now." And I'm always fascinated by the there, the getting there. How do you get there? What's there, you know? And and how do you determine what there is? So talk to us a little bit about the idea of getting there. What do you mean by it? And what's the problem with the mindset? Well, for me, the there was an unreal, unrealistic, undefined expectation. So, and again, one of the things that I think happened to cause that in me was comparison. You know, I looked at the church down the street and saw what it was doing. I looked at the mega church. We have a mega church in our area, looked at what it was doing. And so to me, arrival was to get to a place where they were. And so I constantly compared myself to others to the point that if you and I had gone to school together or been grown up together and we're both doing ministry and, and you're pastoring a church and it's running a thousand and I'm pastoring a church and it's running 50. If I had run into, you know, if my wife and I had run into you and your wife in a restaurant, I would have, if you hadn't seen me, I'd duck out. Mm. I would leave because not because of you, but because I'm embarrassed myself. And, 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 and here's the problem. When you don't have a clear definition of that expectation, you, you never, you never arrive, you know, because it's kind of like the finish line keeps getting moved. You know, or the rules keep changing in the midst of the game. Uh, and, and for me personally, I, 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 I had a pastor ask me one day, he said, Dale, what's it going to take for you to feel satisfied? Hmm. And I said, I absolutely do not know. Interesting. Because when we're on the road, Ed, if we do a, if we go do a concert at church, let's say 50 people came forward and, and, and an altar call and, and, and 20 of them gave their life to Jesus. Uh, the, my, my thing would be, well, it should have been 21. Sure. So I, I never allowed myself just to enjoy ministry. And at some point I encountered a, a dear friend, uh, a counselor in Texas named Bob Hemp, who taught me this principle that Jesus always intended for us to do ministry from him and not for him. And I, and I was always like, I used an example in the book. We had a cat named Charlie and Charlie would come from time to time and bring, he was outside cat. He'd bring these gifts and lay them on the back porch, you know, like a squirrel or a, a, a chipmunk or something like that. We didn't ask for that gift, but he was always bringing these gifts and leaving them for us. And, and I felt like that's what I was doing to God is I'm coming to Jesus and I'm offering him these sacrifices, these, these, these gifts that he never intended for me to, to provide. And so just not knowing how to define what the expectations were was really got, what got me in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, I sort of have this mixed response. I mean, I agree with everything we said, but I got this mixed response to it because there's this sense that I'm always wanting to see more people come to Christ, more people be engaged mm -hmm. in the life of yes. the church, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a that's part of what motivates me. I'm a missiologist. I want to see more people come to Christ in this church planting movement, in this you know tribal group, and so and so. So it's it's part of wired in there. Um, so how do you sort of walk that interesting line? Because again, for me, I, I, it was unhealthy a lot. So yes. you know, I remember as a younger pastor, maybe I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. Like every week, I'd be like, I, I just look at that. I got to have more people this week than next week. And if I didn't, they didn't get there. It was pretty mm -hmm. demoralizing. And it was really it was really bad and unhealthy for me spiritually. But I think probably it's not so healthy for you to say, you know, whatever the Lord does, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just going to trust him because it doesn't motivate you to seek to reach people. Yes. So how do you sort of find that balance? What does that look like? Well, some of it's personality driven. I, I'm very, I'm like you, I'm very driven. Uh, and so I, I want to accomplish things. I want to do things, but here's the thing. I grew up in a South in South Carolina in a Southern Baptist church. And our whole focus was evangelism. Uh, and, and, uh, and our thing was, okay, we believe, you know, in, in, in that the, you can't do anything to earn salvation. You know, it's, it's a free gift, free gift, free gift. You know, you can't do anything to make God love you anymore. You can't do anything to make God love you any less. Then you spend the rest of your life proving how saved you are by your works <laughs> that got down on the inside of me ed and so it was just like I, I grace seemed to be too good of a too good of a deal if, if i can that's a bad way of wording it but it seemed to be good, too good to be true in a sense and so i still feel like i needed to help jesus help me so i just brought that right into pastoring i brought mm -hmm. that right into ministry and 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 so yes i wanted to reach everybody i want to reach the whole world as long as there's one lost soul and and i have a one of the things that really affected my life was i used to go to these youth rallies when i was a kid and they would tell you things like when you get to heaven they're going to show a big video of your life and it's going to show all the people in hell that you didn't reach because these there are these people that if you don't reach them they're not you know they're going to not make it and and that I believed in that and it got inside of me. So when I couldn't accomplish it, dude, that's what led to me feeling like such a failure because I was driven in, in the tension that you're discussing. Uh, I was driven to try to reach everybody. Uh, but then when I couldn't, 
uh, I just, I turned on myself, if you could say it like that. Mm. Okay, good. So, so, so let's, so let's talk some about how to, how you found your way through. Cause I mean, that's, that's a big part of the book too. So again, the book stalled, hope it helped for pastors who thought they'd be there by now. I mean, it's biographical and I like that about it, right? It's kind of biographical. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some incorrect standards that you, um, and other pastors have used to measure success and failure? Well, obviously comparing myself to others, um, not not uh, having this is huge. Not having a devotional life, but having a perform uh, preparing for ministry life. If that makes sense. So so I'm I'm in the Word. I'm praying, but I'm always preparing for next Sunday. Uh, but never having a fellowship life with Jesus. Not you know relaxing with Jesus. Being you know. And another huge factor, Ed, was I didn't Sabbath. You know, we I preached on Sabbath. I talked about Sabbath. I talked about how I believe it was important, but I didn't do it personally because I had this um, this mindset that that God didn't intend for His servants to to be able to rest and chill. That you know that even though you know the the, the, the we're, this is what we do full time. You know, it's an eighty hour week job, but you're ne- it's twenty four seven all the time. And so I had this mentality in my life that um, that I couldn't chill, that I couldn't enjoy my walk with God, uh, not because again, not because of Jesus, but because of, of my own my own um, problems. And then the big thing that happened to Dale was that when I was fifty three years old, I had quadruple bypass surgery, and what brought that surgery on, you know, I, I, there's no heart disease in our family. Uh, I was not severely overweight, and I never smoked except for six months in high school. But I did inhale because that's terrible for you. I didn't know people inhaled smoke. But anyway, uh, so I asked my surgeon. I said, "How did this happen to me? I'm 53 years old." And he said, "Hypertension, high blood pressure because of your vocation." And I said, "Are you saying the ministry almost killed me?" He said, "That's exactly what I'm saying." And then I said the dumbest thing. I said, "But my stress is good stress. I love what I do." And he goes, "Dale, your body doesn't know the difference." And if I had one area that I think pastors across the board, large church, small church, any denomination, the area that's just wiping us out is we do not take care of our temple. And I was very guilty of that. Fascinating, fascinating, and important too, because it's it's an it's, it's an area for me that I you know I got to grow in. I got to work in as well. And I, it's a pretty common area, I think, for pastors. In, well, you know, in, we could preach on drinking and smoking and all those things you're not supposed to do, but we could also eat 15 pieces of fried chicken, you know. Yep. And so it just, especially if you're going to connect with the next gens that are coming up, you can't avoid. You can't avoid it. You, you got to take care of yourself. Okay. So, and, and when you say take care of yourself, tell me about somehow because you you had you talk about some of your own where you got stuck in stall, where you started struggling in these areas, and then some changes you made. Talk personally about some of the changes you made. I went. I got counseling, brother. Mm-hmm. I, I, it, but the problem was I didn't have anyone locally that I feel like I could talk to, uh, I, because of I'm a natural leader. Every seemed like every time I got involved with something, I ended up leading it. But I got to a place where I was so broken uh, that I reached out for help and went for counseling, mm-hmm. and uh, just you know sat on the couch and talked about things. And I had to do that, man. And and uh, that's what's that's what's changed my life today more than anything is getting an outside perspective because, you know, in the book, I make this statement, you know, that, that when you have, um, when you, when you have blind spots, you can't see what your problem is. <laughs> and my editors go, Hey, that's deep Dale. But it's true. When you, you've got to have somebody in your life that can help point out your blind spots or else you'll just keep functioning with them and not know they're there and everybody else can see them. And, and I made this statement. I said, you know, um, what's obvious to everybody else is also often, often oblivious to us. Hmm. Mm, I like that. And so, and so you said counselor, but my guess is a counselor is, I mean, you said pointing out the blind spots. When I think about counseling, I don't, I think of that more as somebody who holds me accountable and points out the blind. I guess it depends upon the different kinds of relationship Mm -hmm. that you have. So you got some outside help, which is really Mm -hmm. key. We're very pro that at the podcast. We think people, you know, I, I think when pastors just normalize that and they're talking in church and pastor says, you know, when I was talking to my counselor this week, Mm -hmm. you know, my counselor said, you know, I, I think that's a good thing. It tells people it's normal. Um, yeah, so but and so stalling out for those of you who haven't read the book, and I encourage you to get it. Stalling out is not just uh, I stalled out because my attendance was three hundred, and now it's yes. two ninety, and I'm stalled out there. There's it's a you, you know, I encourage you to read the book, but it's a totality of that. What are some warning signs that a pastor is stalling out, Bill? Well, truthfully, you can stall at any. You know, there's multiple natural levels of growth, like the two hundred barrier, the five hundred barrier, the thousand. So you can stall at any area there. But once again, it's uh, it's not having. Uh, I think one of the things that really hurts us as small church pastors is that we don't build a team. And, and, and here's the, you know, I, I think it's very simple why 95% of the churches in our country t- tend to be smaller midsize. I think it's because we af- avoid or just don't do Ephesians 4. 
where Jesus said, I'm going to give you these gifts. And a gift of the pastor is to equip saints to do ministry. We don't tend to do that. We don't do it for two reasons. One, uh, we don't do it because many pastors define their life by being a pastor. So instead of it being Ed or Dale, it's Pastor Ed or Pastor Dale. Right. And we need to do everything to be needed to fill that emotional tank. That's unhealthy, and, and it'll, it'll wipe you out eventually. I was there. The second thing I think affects, especially the smaller churches, is a lot of our church government is not necessarily biblical. It's American. And so we view our pastors as hirelings. We view our pastors as you work for us. And I mean, you know, I, I work with pastors every week and I have pastors who will call me and say, Hey, the, the deacon board called me in last night and said, they're not happy with what I'm doing, that I'm not visiting enough, or I'm not doing this enough. They don't like my preaching. And they, and, and they literally say, you work for us and we're your boss. Well, that's not healthy either. When you view your pastor as a congregation, as a hireling, uh, that's not a biblical concept. So both of those things, they work together uh, to keep us from doing if I can say it this way, from doing church the way Jesus laid out for us to do it. And so that we just perpetuate the problem um, when we have that approach. Okay. So I'm guessing a lot of people will think they're either stalled personally, uh, maybe relationally, maybe organizationally in the church, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what's a, what's the first step um, to come out of that state, state and then talk about some you know other steps to move forward as well. But what's what's first and then what's subsequent steps? Yep, number one, you got to recognize and be honest about where you are. And I see, and I couldn't do that, Ed. I couldn't do that for 20 years. Yeah. Again, because it made me look a failure. But I finally had to reach a point where going, this isn't working. To quote John Maxwell, hey man, if what you're doing is not working, you got to change what you're doing. I, I preached that. I just didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have a reality check. And then the second thing you've got to do once you have a reality check, we we'll move to the thing we've just said. You you got to get you got to get someone outside of your life who can speak truth to you. When Promise Keepers came out back in you know the year back in the eighties nineties, one of the things they started doing was they, they created or asked church people to create these uh, accountability groups. So you'd get together with three or four guys every week and you're supposed to spill your beans. I'm like I'm not doing that. And and the reason I didn't want to do that is because before I'm gonna be honest with you and tell you how I feel. I got to know you love me. If I don't know you love me, I'm not going to share my my junk with you. And and so many pastors, you know, Ed, they said in um, early days of, of Promise Keepers that at the average pastor uh, or 70% of all pastors didn't have one close personal friend. Really? And I just saw that statistic again two months ago. That's not what we've been called to do. That we're not supposed to sacrifice living to do ministry. We're supposed to model it. And and when you live your life and you don't have a close personal friend that you can talk to, you can be honest with it, then you're setting yourself up for failure. So you go from, you know, from it, those two things. And then you begin, I think the next step is you've got to do things to build a, to build a team, to have a team ministry. And, and honestly, I, you need to work yourself out of a job. And I don't mean you don't have a vocational job, but, but you need to work yourself out of doing everything to releasing people to do ministry. Yeah. And those are, I mean, those are all things. I mean, that's like, that's like a whole lot you just said in that sentence. It's like there's personal stuff, and then there's, you know, you got to get some accountability, and then you got to build a team. I mean, that's like a world of learning uh, that for a lot of pastors they they struggle with. But but I do think that, I mean, it, does, it really does lay out why people get stalled and stuck and how to get unstuck. And so, again, that's why we wanted to have you on to talk about stalled as well and kind of unpack some of what that, you know, where where do we go from here? Um, pain, pain will make you make the move you need to make. If you are not willing to listen to the podcast or listen to Ed or, or learn from someone, then at some point the pain becomes so great that it's going to motivate you. And we want it. We want you to not have to get to that point because sometimes when you get in pain, you start medicating that pain with all kinds of things. You, you start trying to find outside things to solve that inner problem and that inner turmoil. And for me, uh, my outer thing wasn't, you know, drugs, alcohol, all that stuff that you hear about. Mine was working myself to death, mm -hmm. you know, and pastors are pretty notorious for that. Yeah, totally. Um, what about the possibility that people need, some people might need to walk away from ministry for a season? Um, you know, is that, is that a good thing? What do you, or, you know, sometimes maybe we we're discouraged and we want to walk away, but we shouldn't. Sometimes we should talk to us a little bit about that. I had a pastor friend that I talked to one time who was been very hurt in a church split and uh, he was about to go start a new church. And I went to him and, and, and I, and I was vulnerable. And I said, look, I'm really concerned about you because you're so injured. 
And I said, you know, if you're going to start this church, can you not wait a few months before you do it? Because you're not healthy, your family's not healthy, and, and you're going to start an unhealthy church. And he made this statement to me. He said, well, what I've discovered is, is when you're hurting, the thing to do is you just keep going and you get healed in the process. And so I said, so if you break your leg, you're supposed to go out and play basketball on it? That makes no sense. You, you, when you're hurt, when you're broken, when you're in that situation, you, you've got to stop and acknowledge that you're hurting and you're broken and you need help. And we, we don't tend to do that as pastors because, again, if we defined ourselves by ministry, if we define ourselves by, you know, this is who we are, then, then that, that's the problem. So, yes, I think it's very important. That if you're in an unhealthy place, if you need to take a break, get you a job at Home Depot for a while, because the calling's not going to go away. If you are called into ministry, I know there's people today who don't believe in that, but it's true. If you've been called into ministry, that, that calling won't go away, but there's nothing wrong with taking a break. I took a break for five years, Ed, hmm. after our church, after our church uh, fell apart. Uh, we went through a church split and then we hang, held on for a few more years. And then it's because I was done. I had nothing to offer. I couldn't lead. I couldn't lead myself, much less lead anyone else. And so I took a five-year break. I grew up building houses. So I had construction to fall back on. I know some pastors don't, but it'd be better to get you, get your head screwed on. If I can say it that way and get your mind clear and get your heart clear and then be affected because an unhealthy pastor is always going to create an unhealthy ministry. Mm. Yeah, no, no question. Now, now, um, you know, it's interesting because some people, you could listen to the podcast, some people, you know, they might maybe listen on a Monday and they, what they need to hear is don't quit. But mm -hmm. there is actually a place to say, you know, step aside if it's There's the right wrong thing to do. Break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing There's wrong with taking a break. That's good. And, you know, the challenge is, is that a lot, of, a lot of pastors and leaders don't have other skills to draw upon or they, and they don't have a church that can finance a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we, and we get that those things are complicated, but, you know, you, you and your family are always going to be more important yes. uh, in the long run than the tasks that you perform. And I think that's, yes. if you need to step away from those tasks, you know, that, that, that's, that's part of that necessity. A sabbatical is a great idea, but Ed, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but so many, especially in the small and mid-sized church space, they're resistant to even a pastor going on sabbatical because they don't, they think, well, hey, I'd love to take a few days. I'd love to take some weeks right. off. You right. know, so it, they don't even see the value in that. And, and honestly, you need a sabbatical, uh, especially if you don't Sabbath, it's all built up. But, you know, if you Sabbath every week, then the need's not quite the same. I think that's a good point. Healthy. That's a good point. You could yeah. just create better rhythms rather mm -hmm. than needing to even disrupt your unhealthy rhythms. You could. But, you know, for some people, they need that jolt. And again, this is and I'm recording this while I'm on sabbatical. So, you know, it's, but an academic sabbatical is a little different. I just taught a class last week. I, know, I was right going to ask you this question. So you're yeah. on sabbatical, but we're working. So yeah, exactly. Really? <laughs> exactly. I'm on sabbatical. It's a weird thing. I'm on sabbatical from Wheaton College duties. Okay. like academic administration, but I'm still, you know, my podcast and I still work at the magazine, stuff like that. So it's a weird thing. Um, what would you say to pastors who are listening, who are stalled and about to walk away for the wrong reasons? What, what would you, what encouragement would you give for them? Oh, well, they have to identify what that the, the, they have the wrong reasons. And I think that's very difficult to do when you're in the minutia and the pressure and the stress of ministry. Uh, and and uh, one of the things I like to use as an example of, uh, I, I actually went on sabbatical last year. And when I was on the sabbatical, um, our family was uh, had gone to, to Hilton Head and um, we were out in the ocean and my family, my wife, my daughter and a friend got caught in a rip current. And we got ripped way out. We, Ed, we were further out. We were closer to a tour boat than we were the, the, the shore. And it happened in a minute. Well, I'm panicking. Uh, I'm freaking out. And I got to a point where literally I was I was probably 10 seconds away from, from drowning. I ended up in the ER. Uh, it was horrible. But at the very last second when I couldn't hold on any longer, uh, my friend had broken away from the rip current. She went and got help. And this dude I've never met in my life, I didn't even get his name, comes to me over a wave and, and with a boogie board. And, and I hold on to it, and he drags me back in. Uh, I think for you, Pastor, today, when you've been struggling and straining and fighting, you're trying to you're trying to do it all, and you're wearing yourself out, you're going to have to reach out for help. If I had not reached out for help, I would not be on this podcast today. I was at a place to where I was at the end of my rope. Uh, and again, that put me, that really broke me. It put me in long story, but it put me in extensive, extensive uh, a week of counseling afterwards. But, but I just know that pastors, there is help available. You know, this podcast, what we do at 95 network, there's, there's, there's all these opportunities, but you've got to accept the help. And I think sometimes we don't do that. We won't take in what's right in front of us. 
good conversation, a good place to end the conversation. Thanks for joining us, Dale Sellers. Thank you for having me.